Hello and welcome to the Push Forward Podcast, where we dive deep into the stories and strategies that drive success in business and in life. I'm your host, Alex, and today we have a truly remarkable guest with us, Talon Raman Figueroa. Talon is a mastermind in the world of personal branding. She's known for her dynamic approach to content creation and brand presence. So she's here to share with us the insights on content creation from a brand's perspective the importance of self-branding for business owners, solopreneurs, creators. And then she's also going to share her techniques to make a lasting impression in just seven seconds. So get ready to be inspired and learn how to elevate your brand. So I want to welcome you to the podcast today, Talon. Awesome. Thank you. What's up, everyone? All right. Fantastic. So Tell us, because I, I looked at your background, it's phenomenal. You're originally from the UK, London, you worked in government. Tell, tell us about that experience before we get into the branding, because I know you helped diplomats do branding, but that's like so different than entrepreneurship and business, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, coming from London, everything is competition. It's so hard for you to... Be better than other people. It doesn't matter how educated you are, how many awards you have, or how many awesome people you work with. There's always going to be someone who one does a one up on you. And honestly, that level of competition is absolutely relentless. So back in the UK, I had my first business. It was called Grassroot Diplomat. And this is how I got involved in working with public figures, politicians, diplomats, um, which was tough, you know? I'm I'm doing this all by myself and I've managed to like open up this really difficult iron doors. Um, and my job was to get one-to-one -one time with them and really dive, de um, dive deep into their why. Like, why are you in this position right now? When, how did you end up here? And let's remind you of that why so that you can reconnect back to your constituents the people you're trying to influence and honestly a lot of them are so high up on the ladder they forget about that so I'm basically bringing them back all the way back and then reminding them of what their narrative is right and I think it's government is so different too because I think most of us are so jaded in the the, the our political views because of Obviously, the way the world goes, you know, mm. there's all kinds of extreme sides. And so I have to imagine that that is way harder to do to create a narrative for a politician than it is for a business that's just selling a product or a service. Exactly. Way harder is absolutely correct. Capital letters. Um, because I think you have to remember governments are representing their, uh, sorry, politicians and diplomats. They are representing a government. They are not representing themselves. So they never say I, it's always we. So there is a separation, that barrier that is um, giving them the protection to never get too close to an individual or something that doesn't benefit their national interest. With entrepreneurs, that's completely different. We don't have those rules. We can completely break down any sort of barriers. And the problem with a lot of solopreneurs that I've witnessed, and I've worked with over a hundred small businesses, um, since I started Boss Diplomat, a lot of them are ghosts. Like, who are you? Who is running this business? Who's created this product? Why are you providing this specific service? Like, who are you? It's really, really difficult to engage with that solopreneur when they are being invisible or they're being too shy or they keep telling themselves they're introverts and they don't know how to do this. Look, every single one of us has a story. I'm curious to know what your story is. Um, if I'm curious, I'm sure other people are going to be curious. And the minute you break down that barrier and talk about yourself, like I'm talking about like a 1% like creek, a peek behind that door of why you started this business, all of a sudden you're going to start to have this kind of like community of like-minded people who see you for who you are, respect you for what you're offering and know that you are the only person that can actually bring a solution to that very specific problem. That's what branding is. I like that. And it, it, it gets me thinking about 
a conversation that I often have with entrepreneurs, especially like those mom and dadpreneurs, the, the ones mm -hmm. who are parents, they're juggling, they have multiple businesses, they have the shiny ob object syndrome, which I do have always had. <laughs> and, and I own it, by the way, right? I own it. I find it incredibly difficult, Talon, to mm -hmm. stick to one message because I'm involved in so many different things. Yeah. Um, and and I and I I hear that from other entrepreneurs that have the same challenge that I do, which is I've got my hands involved here, 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 there, and the other. And it can muddy the waters when you have someone who wants to do business with you on business A, mm -hmm. and they go and they say, well, wait, but what? You're doing this, this, that, the other. So perhaps sometimes that is the most challenging things for this type of entrepreneur in that the image that you project is so all over the place. And um, while, while most of those things may be working for you, that might not be the perception on the other end. So how do you help those entrepreneurs overcome that? Because I, I get that question all the time. And I said, look, I'm a marketer. I'm not a branding expert. And I struggle with that myself, Talon. Listen, Dad Fanet, do you want to work forever? Uh, do I want to work forever? I mean, yeah. it depends if you, if you love what you're doing, right? Okay. Okay. Well, if you have all of these business, what are the ones that you really want to focus on? And what are the businesses that you're just like, this is just eating up my time. Right. If yeah. We all have those for sure. Yeah, exactly. So look, one of the things about being a solopreneur is you, you started a business for a reason, right? You potentially don't want to work for other people. Um, right. The corporate world is just not for you. Um, you don't want to be, um, liable to someone else i mean your mm -hmm. clients are your clients but you don't have a boss you are now the boss why are you being such a tough boss on yourself by giving yourself all of this extra work when that time can actually go somewhere else so my job as a brand consultant also aka fairy boss mother because <laughs> my job is to make sure look do you really want to work every single day of your life number one number two is it worth it? Like, do you really like want to run all of these multiple plates at the same time? Because one of them is going to fall. And then number three, what are your top three priorities for yourself other than making money? Because that can't seriously be your only objective. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I find that, you know, with what I do too, you know, I've had a podcast for about five years and it's a totally separate project. I try not mm. to advertise anything that I do. Like, you know, some podcasters out there are like, what are you doing? You should be advertising your businesses there. I said, I, but I don't want to do that. So I'm very, I'm very aware of those things, or maybe in the community, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs too, who, um, as part of like their mission, their value is like, I want to give back, work with nonprofits, NGOs, and they do that right as well. Yeah. But that's not directly making them money. It's just obviously hel helping them give back. Um, but again, I still have that challenge, Talon, and so do these, these other entrepreneurs that tell me, say, like, get me a brand strategist that can help me unify my messaging. Um, and and I think if I'm hearing you correctly, is you're saying like, which one of those things are the things that you're, you know, enjoying the most, the best at, and then hone in on on that thing, right? Yeah. So what, when I work with my entrepreneurs, I always stick to the power of threes. The um, power of three. The power of threes always works because um, when you have too many options, um, so if you're giving your clients or yourself too many options, you always have to say, let me look at it, I'll come back to you, and then you're ghosted. And then yes. if you only have two options, you don't look serious enough because it's like something's missing here. So the power of three is really great. And when I come and sit down with an entrepreneur, I look at everything that they're doing and um, it's not that difficult to know why you're so passionate about so many things. We wear multiple hats. We have to respect that, but there is a unifying reason why you're doing all of those things. Mm -hmm. My job is to like pull it all together, find that golden thread that keeps everything together. Now um, the difference between selling a service or a product versus doing content are two separate bags completely so i'll give you an example with myself um i have my own podcast i i have a youtube channel i blog twice a week and i'm active on instagram every single day that is completely separate from the work that i do with my clients because when you're marketing yourself when even when you're when you're at your most busiest 
you have to do even more marketing. Right. What solopreneurs tend to do is when they're when they're in the slowest period, that's when they start to do marketing right. because they're they're like, oh my god, I've got nothing in the pipeline and freaking out. And this is when they're hammering on in the content. But then the minute they get busy, boom, silence. So you and I know it's really important that you constantly market yourself, but that is different from your actual day-to-day -day business that you do with your clients or selling that product. So we need to keep those bags quite separate. Okay. Um, so when it comes to all of the different things that you're involved in, what I look for is, okay, what are the common things that you have with all of your passions or interests or businesses? And then how, how can we pull them together so that there's a service A, service B, and a service C? All of a sudden, it's a lot more manageable now because with each service has its own narrative. And with its own narrative, you have like topics. You're basically creating lanes for each of your interest. The job is stick with your lane, go as deep into your lane as possible. Try not to overstep on the other lanes because then you're going to crash into competitors and other things. The, the best thing you could do is the deeper you go, the more you're going to be known as being an expert in your industry. And not a lot of people dig that deep because they, they kind of give up halfway because it's so much work. But imagine if you just start to surpass all of these comp competitors and people who do something similar in your space, but you've been doing this for a while and you're tenacious, you're constantly marketing, you're constantly talking about this one thing for service A. You're going to surpass those competitors and then only you're the one that, you're the one that's left behind talking about this one issue. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that gets me thinking about audience too. I know it's mm. something that you talk about a lot. Yeah. And I think for many small businesses, especially startups, they're trying to be everything to everyone and be mm. everywhere. So talk about trying to be everything to everyone and everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean like every channel, right? Which is sometimes I'll see um, a, a, a a business owner who has a thriving business and they have a thriving following, let's say on LinkedIn, if they're selling B2B services mm -hmm. and, but they're also trying to just repurpose all the same content mm -hmm. on Instagram, TikTok, everywhere. And then you go, they have like no engagement there. Do you recommend against that? And just to be where you're going to be present? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, with your target audience, um, I go a step further and talk about your primary target audience. Okay. So this is the analogy that I always share is that dartboard analogy. Everyone on that dartboard is your target audience, but your primary target audience are the people in that red bullseye. And those are the audience, the people who are willing to pay you whatever you want. Mm -hmm. They're going to constantly come back to you and they are going to be your higher ticket clients why talk to everyone else when you know that those people are willing to pay you ten thousand dollars for your service or your product rather than right rather than spending time and effort and um, talking to people who are going to negotiate you down want something for free overstep your boundary um you know ghost you for a while and then two months later say oh by the way i looked at that project and i'm not happy with it Dude, that was like two months ago. You, right? That time period for revision is over. You don't want those people to work with you. Like I agree so with why you. Not chasing them, right? I I agree with you because that happens so much in business, right? No matter how big or small the company, I talk to a lot of biz dev and salespeople in trying mm. to integrate a marketing strategy that aligns with marketing and sales and customer service, and. This is obviously a, one of the biggest challenges for salespeople, right? It's like, yeah. which leads do I qualify? Which ones do I nurture? Which ones do I do I chase, not chase, punt, not punt? Yeah. And um, I'm with you. I, I talk about that a lot with my own team and that, look, if we want to have a guest on the podcast, just like we wanted to have you come in and talk about branding to our listeners, um, mm. if I have to chase you, for the next six months, it's okay. Then you probably just don't want to be in the, a guest in the podcast. Right. But if we if we hit it off and and it's a right the right fit, the right schedule, the right topic, then 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 let's do it. But not keep right. And but I think there's something else to be said about this too, Talon. And see see if you think the same. Sometimes, some this happens to salespeople. They'll abandon the lead in, in B two B or B two C. They'll abandon the lead because they think that the customer 
doesn't want or need their service, right? Mm -hmm. When in fact, it's just that that customer is a horrible communicator, sucks mm -hmm. at following up, doesn't answer their calls, and 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 is the type of customer that needs you to chase them. I, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Everyone can decide right. for themselves. So how do you how do you position yourself in a way that you don't abandon the people who are like, hey, I actually want to do business with Talon. I need branding strategy, but I, I'm just so busy and I'm just a horrible communicator. And then like, if you alienate them, then you give up mm. to the competition. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, this is a really simple answer to that. And that's called process. So um, the way I work, um, and this is something that I share with a lot of my clients, is make yourself premium to the point where you don't have an open calendar of meeting dates. It's like schedule, like one, like for me, I only have two meetings per day, um, mon uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So three days out of the seven, those are my meeting days. Um, but I'm only having two meetings per day. So really, I'm only meeting people two, four, six times a week. That gets booked up really quickly, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden, it, it will look like I am booked out for the next three months. No one can get a hold of me. But then it just looks like you are, you are so successful mm -hmm. that there's a queue of people wanting to work with you. So you're already building that demand because you're not available to them. Mm -hmm. Now, if they if they really, really want to work with you and you know they can't get a hold of you on your calendar, then of course they'll find alternative ways to contact you. This is why I'm available on Instagram, like I DM like crazy. You know, my my emails are open to me. There's always ways that you can connect mm -hmm. with me. Now, if they can make the effort to find that information and then get in touch with me, great. I'm gonna give them a shot. And yes, I'm gonna find space in my calendar to see them because they've made that effort to me. So I'm never in a position where I'm chasing my clients. I've now flipped the script and I've put them in a position where, oh my goodness, she's never going to be available. I need to find another way to get in touch with her. Now they're doing some creative thinking into how do I get in touch with this individual? How do I make this happen? And of course, when you have that call, don't turn it into an hour, just keep it short, keep it sweet. And if they're willing to work with you, get them to commit on the spot. Would you like to work with me? I get booked up three months in advance. If you decide today that you want to work with me, I can schedule you in in this date. I like that. And, but we need to get that secured. Like, I'm not wasting time here. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you're right. You can't just like leave your calendar open and take in every meeting. You really have to qualify them. So, so talk to me. Something that you discussed in your uh, YouTube videos, which I encourage our listeners to go to your YouTube. You've got like phenomenal, really, like really great content, especially your shorts. They're right there at the top. Um, but a couple of the things that stood out to me was, you know, I work with a lot of photographers, videographers mm -hmm. and whatnot, and it, there are executives, entrepreneurs out there who decide yeah. that they're going to go down a, a, a route where it's like, look, here's my look. This is mm -hmm. my look. I wear this company shirt all the time. I mean, you even see this with influencers and creators, right? Like yeah. I'm following these two guys who they're young from Toronto, two dancers, and they dance together and they always have their their little logo on their shirt, right? So, oh, so. But it's not, it's not just the logo, but you remember them, right? Not just for yeah. what they do, but also because they're consistent every time mm. they come on there. And like, I feel like you're consistent in that way too. Like in, in my head, I thought, is she gonna come on the show with a hat, uh, her wrap? Like what, what what's it gonna look like? You're very consistent across all the platforms. So you become more memorable. There's no doubt, right? Yeah. Whereas me, over the last 23 years as an entrepreneur, like I've got so many different looks, right? Like I may mm -hmm. be wearing a sweatshirt today, tomorrow a dress shirt, the next day a company shirt. So I'm pretty inconsistent. Mm -hmm. I feel, you know, I could say all day that it works for me because I'm I'm happy in the way I am, but I will acknowledge, Talon. So this mm -hmm. is for our listeners to know that I don't say do as I do. I yeah. will acknowledge that being consistent in your look, how you put everything together is a much more, um, uh, it's, it's just a better way to go about staying, you know, memorable. What, so talk to us about that. Yeah. So branding is all about consistency, whether it's your content, whether it's what you're providing, whether it's the values that you have, 
dress is something that I always bring up because no one else is doing it, especially in the branding world. So um, dressing consistently is all about having a strategy like everything else in your business, right? So when you have a strategy with how you're dressing, it, it, it's broken down in three really simple parts. Again, three, I'm telling you, it's the magic number. <laughs> so number one, you um, when you know your colors, like every single one of us, have a seasonal color palette that is perfect for us, no matter how much sun exposure you have. So this is based on your eyes, your hair, and your undertone. So this is the color that sits under your skin. You're either a cool tone or a warm tone. And then based on that, we figure out what your color palette is. Um, I think I might have an example behind me. Um, <laughs> but this is like 150 tones. This is a lot of colors for you to work with. But when you wear the right colors, you always look fresh. So I could, I, you probably not, you probably don't know that I slept two hours last night, but based on how I put myself together, I always look fresh yeah. face, ready to go, <laughs> energetic. I may feel like crap, but you might not, you might, you know, you might not know that. Um, but that's what color does. It kind of tricks your brain into thinking, wow, this person is always glowing. Um, so it gives you that natural glow. When you wear the wrong colors, like you've been there, you know, you go to a party and someone's wearing the wrong colors. You're just like, oh, what, what happened to them? Or, you know, subconsciously that that just looks awful on them, but you just can't tell why right. they're wearing the wrong colors for their, for their, for their complexion. That's right. So that's the first part. Once you know your colors, then we move on to your style. So the whole point about how you dress, um, especially as an entrepreneur, um, Having that, I mean, a lot of people feel as though having a brand consistency can like really narrow down the options. That's far from the truth because all of a sudden you're dressing exactly how you want to dress every single day. Mm -hmm. Plus your wardrobe is not like 12,000 outfits that you never look into because the average individual only utilizes like 10 to 20% of their wardrobe. What we then do is create you a capsule wardrobe where you're actually utilizing like close to 90% of your wardrobe and mm -hmm. everything matches seamlessly. So guess what? You can wear a sweatshirt and a shirt and all of the other things that you do, but we can actually put looks together where you actually look the way you want to look like. Mm -hmm. You feel comfortable because you have to dress to your lifestyle. There's no point coming Absolutely. in on this podcast with a big dress and like makeup full of like, you know my face done and I don't actually look like that so you have to be consistent and authentic to your lifestyle and then the last part is yes it's it is that consistency because if I showed up in a hoodie and a sweatshirt tomorrow on a zoom call you won't recognize me so that recognize rec, you know being able to be recognized and memorable is all part of that brand so mm -hmm. whenever I have a client on any of my calls they, what they see is what they get. This is how I'm dressed every single day. I could be out with my toddler playing. I'm still dressed the same because the way I dress is practical for my lifestyle. I will never tell someone how to dress right? or how to look. It's based on your personality, your lifestyle, and actually what you feel comfortable with. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I know like over the years, um, and I, I go speak at different colleges, like kids who are graduating. I just spoke at a class uh, last week at Florida Atlantic University. And we talk about branding LinkedIn and all that stuff that they need to do to go out there and get mm -hmm. a job and marketing themselves. And and getting dressed is like one of those, right? Yeah. Because so, so many of them feel like they're we're in this um, world now where if you see like influencers and, and then you even see entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley where just, you know, a t-shirt is acceptable. But, mm -hmm. but just because that's what they're choosing to do and they've already made it, you know, somebody right. like Mark Zuckerberg, that's very different than you. You're, you're just starting out. Like mm -hmm. you can't go in and, you know, cause that's the image you're projecting. You're saying, I don't care. I'm right. here with a t-shirt, a ball cap. And I'm saying to them, like, look, so even for myself, like when I go speak at conferences, I always wear either a jacket or a suit not, yeah. Nothing stuffy, something that I'm comfortable in. I don't love wearing ties. So even if I'm wearing a, a suit or a jacket, it's just a nice shirt underneath. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel comfortable, you know, comfortable shoes. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm presentable at, 
w- would I prefer to just be more relaxed? Yes, but I want to make sure that I'm giving the audience my best self, right? Yes. And so I think it's kind of like selfish in that way. And I talk about this with a lot of entrepreneurs who don't want to be on digital. You were talking about that mm-hmm. at the beginning, at the top of the podcast. You said, "Well, if you can't find someone," and I I have this problem with a lot of um, business owners who are like, "I'm not going to do. I, I don't want to be on social media. I don't even want to put my bio in my in my on my website. I don't, mm-hmm. I'm not going to do headshots. I'm nowhere to be found." And to me, it's like. So you want people to do business with you yeah? You, and somehow you're exempt from doing all that. I, I just find it extremely selfish. Um, so it's not just a branding thing. It's also about serving people, right? Not making them like go call the FBI just to find out more information about you. You know, I've had, I've had clients like that. So blue collar workers are very atypical of this, uh, typical of this situation. Um, I was working with a painter and he was very staunch like that. Don't want to be on camera. Don't want to, don't, you know, he never had a headshot before. Um, yet he's expecting people to work with him and, and recruit, you know, a bigger team for his um, contracts, plus get professional contractors where he could do commercial work. But he's okay. not to be seen. So what I did was, let's check out your competitors. Like, let's see how other commercial painters are presenting themselves and then how we can make you even an inch better than all of these guys. Um, so on our call, I must have like reviewed, I think I shortlisted like 350 something um, competitors. This is just in a geographical area. So there's a lot of competition. Mm-hmm. And then we looked at, I think about 20 to 30 hot competitors. We reviewed all of their websites. And one of the things that we found was most of these painters are on Facebook. They don't even have a website, number one. Number two, when you do go into their website, no one is showing themselves up. So it's almost like, who am I going to be talking to at the other side of the phone? Right. Or the email or whatever. Like their business name is like their family name. But it's like, who's behind this? Like you're using your name for your business, but then like, there's not a person behind this. Like what's going on? So already I was able to showing him those examples in his industry. He was already going, I don't like this. This doesn't look good. And that his mind was being chased, changed as I was sharing these evidence right. to him. So I wasn't telling him what to do. He was seeing what the problem was from a competitor plus a consumer point of view. And then he was like, right, Talene, you need to do all of my brand, like fix my website, do this. I will go to a photographer. All of a sudden, he was a different person. Um, And now when you look on his website, it's very clear who's running the business. I mean, again, typical painter, his business name is his name. So now we know who is the face behind this business. And you will be talking with this guy right here. So already there's like a level of friendliness. Sure. Um, you know, you're not anonymous anymore. You know who you're going to talk to. Um, if there's a student who wants to work for him, they're not going to feel, you know, uh, nervous about talking to you because you've broken that barrier down. So remember how at the beginning I was talking about how governments have all these barriers up? Mm-hmm. Entrepreneur, well, the barriers need to come down because you you want to connect with your audience. And that's and that is very typical. I know just from talking to our listeners, we do a couple surveys every year, and one of the top words that people give why they are their mm-hmm. own boss is they want the freedom, freedom to yeah. do whatever the hell they want to do when they want to do it. But with that, still comes responsibility, right? You mm-hmm. still have to be, as you said, presentable and all of that. So for those listening, like, listen, it's great to have freedom. We know why you do what you do. But you still have to understand that on the other end, there are customers. And if you want to grow, stay consistent, you have to do that branding piece. What's the best, I mean, for someone who's got their brand all over the place, what's like their first stop, really, if they come to you, Talon? We'll just have a chat, just like you and I are having a chat. Quick half an hour, because I want to see where all of the holes are. Look, when you're working... Someone like me who's worked in government, I have a very short amount of time with these individuals. Mm -hmm. I pretty much analyze everything that you say in that one sitting, because the way I work is my brand process is very short. It's three Mm -hmm. weeks. In three weeks, I'll figure everything out for you. In fact, it's not even three weeks. It's you and I have a conversation once your brand is ready the next week. It's that quick. I love it. Um, So I don't like wasting time. I also don't like wasting my entrepreneur's time. 
I want you guys to get moving and and ensure that your brand is something that you can implement immediately and the changes are not so jarring that you're shell-shocked. So it just sounds like every single one of your clients could be a really great fit for me. Awesome. Well, great. Well, definitely, like I said, it's a challenge that every entrepreneur tells me, you know, especially over the years, as you heard more about storytelling and mm. personal branding versus the branding of your company. And in fact, so many of these entrepreneurs are solopreneurs. They may be working with contractors, but as you mentioned, they are the brand. And so they definitely yeah. need that. All right. Before we close out today's podcast, though, now, so you gave us a lot of value today. You talked about branding. You gave some good advice. Um, I wanted to touch on the book that you wrote. Uh, I think it was 2017, right? Women in Diplomacy. What oh, made gosh, you yeah. write that book? Yeah, that was one of my very early dissertations. Um, and um, in that book, I interviewed quite a lot of like British high commissioners. So, you know, ambassadors. Um, mainly about how difficult of a barrier it was for women to move into like higher positions of representing their country. Uh, I just thought it was so interesting because back then no one was talking about it. So I said, fine, I'll do it. Um, so diplomacy is an area that I worked very deeply in. And this is how I came up with the name Boss Diplomat, because I'm still honoring the, the history of my work in diplomacy. But now I'm turning solopreneurs into brand ambassadors for their own business, hence Boss Diplomat. I love it. Your 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 branding is something that anyone who is interested in growing their brand and looking at like what consistency and quality and interesting. Like your your brand is very interesting. So I encourage any of our listeners to go to not only your YouTube, your website, we'll put all of that in the show notes. And I am sure that we're going to have you back at some point. I would love to uh, do like a lab style where we bring in two, three brands that are suffering. And then in real time, you can analyze them. And that I think that would be like really interesting. Oh, I love being put on the spot. I don't mind. <laughs> That'll be fun. Yeah. Fantastic. Talon, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much. This was really fun. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Push Forward podcast. A huge thank you to Talon Raman Figueroa for joining us and sharing her invaluable insights on personal branding and content creation. If today's conversation inspired you, make sure that you subscribe to our podcast and then share it with others who could benefit from these incredible strategies. Your support helps us grow and bring insightful content your way. Don't forget to follow us on social media for updates and sneak peeks into upcoming episodes. I'm your host, Alex, reminding you to push forward in your journey, and we'll see you on the next episode.